Sup, chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova, and what's this? I'm actually doing a hair loss video for a change, and it's not two hours long? Yes, praise the sun. We're back on track to defeating the Slaphead Curse. Debunking the Carnivore Gurus was fun while it lasted, and I did so because hair loss news was slow at the time. But I'm officially done with that now, so please, stop asking me to respond to any more carnivore diet videos or pick any new fights with wellness influencers. I won't rule out ever revisiting the subject again in the future, but you have to keep in mind, I built my channel talking about hair loss, so it isn't fair to my longtime viewers to put hair loss topics on hold any longer to debunk nutritional bro science. I've got a lot of work to do, and that's fine, because we've got a lot of pre-new details on hair loss treatments, and my job as a hair loss witcher is far from over. So before I was sidetracked, I had two videos lined up, this one on topical dutasteride and another one on Brian Johnson's hair loss treatment, and that one will be coming very soon. So, specifically, the video I want to do today is on a recent study that claims that topical dutasteride is superior to oral finasteride. It's this study right here. Now, we already know that oral dutasteride is more effective than oral finasteride. There's no dispute about that. There are several studies comparing the two oral drugs. This article here reviewed all those studies and found that both dutasteride at 0.5 mg per day and at 2.5 mg per day were superior to increasing hair counts compared to finasteride at 1 mg per day. Not only that, there was no difference in adverse events from the two drugs. In fact, some studies even found a lower risk of side effects with dutasteride compared to finasteride, and I talk about that in this video that I'll link below. None of that's surprising, because dutasteride lowers serum DHT and scalp DHT by more than finasteride does. Since DHT is the trash hormone that causes androgenic alopecia, the lower you get your DHT levels, the more effective a treatment it is at stopping hair loss. Of course, that's not to say that oral finasteride has no advantages over oral dutasteride. It is cheaper and more widely available. It also has a shorter half-life, so if you do get side effects, which of course is rare, the side effects will go away much quicker with finasteride compared to dutasteride. Also, even though finasteride is weaker than dutasteride, it will still absolutely stop and reverse hair loss in the vast majority of people. So nobody should think finasteride is useless. I've used it for a long time and it's a fantastic treatment. However, in the case of topical dutasteride, there is very little research on it, and that's probably because just plain old topical dutasteride mixed up in a solvent like alcohol doesn't absorb well through the skin. The reason why is because dutasteride is a larger molecule than finasteride. Dutasteride has a molecular weight of 528 grams per mole. That's above the 500 Dalton limit. The 500 Dalton limit, for those who don't know, that means that any molecule that has a molecular weight greater than 500 grams per mole will have trouble penetrating the skin. Because of this, people have tried different preparations of dutasteride in order to make it penetrate the skin better, or even use dutasteride mesotherapy, which means injecting dutasteride directly into the skin in order to try to improve the effectiveness of topical dutasteride. Unfortunately though, dutasteride mesotherapy is significantly less effective than oral dutasteride, and I actually made a video about that which I'll link below. So, that means that unlike with topical finasteride, where you can just dissolve some finasteride tablets and mix it up yourself in stamoxidine or minoxidil, topical dutasteride needs some special formulations in order to penetrate the skin properly. So, for example, a popular formulation of topical dutasteride is Zion topical dutasteride. It uses a proprietary formula that encapsulates dutasteride into liposomes, which is a lipid nanoparticle. Because this is a proprietary formula, Zion topical dutasteride is pretty expensive. It costs $387 for just a three-month supply, and in my opinion, it isn't worth it in the slightest. You see, the research backing the use of Zion formula of topical dutasteride is incredibly weak. The study that Zion did had only 10 subjects, and it didn't include any any hair loss endpoints like measuring hair counts. The data was never published in a medical journal, so we only have the drug company's word for it that it works. Unfortunately, the FDA does not regulate compounded topical medication like topical dutasteride, so it is very easy for a company to market a formula like this without proving it actually works, so it's almost like the supplement industry. So, actually having a new study on topical dutasteride is a good thing, and the new study we're going to talk about was just published last month. The study was a randomized controlled trial of different concentrations of topical dutasteride compared to oral finasteride at a dose of 1 mg per day, which is the standard dose. There was also a placebo control group. The different concentrations of dutasteride tested were 0.01%, 0.02%, and 0.05%. 
The study enrolled 135 men with ages between 20 and 60 years old. All the men had antriotic alopecia with Norwood classes ranging from class 3 to class 5. None of the men had been on any other hair loss treatment for the last year before entering the study. The study was double-blinded, meaning neither the subjects nor the investigators knew which treatment each patient was on. This is a good study design that theoretically should be unbiased and is free of confounding variables. So, so far so good, but some of the methods that are described in the article are a little vague. For example, the article says, quote, for test participants, one milliliter of dutasteride topical solution was applied with a dropper directly over a targeted 1.9 square centimeter circular area for hair loss on the scalp once daily for 24 weeks, followed by scalp massage with fingers, unquote. A 1.9 square centimeter area is pretty small. It's even smaller than a U.S. penny. A whole milliliter in such a small spot doesn't make any sense. I mean, you could put a whole milliliter of minoxidil on your scalp and get almost complete coverage if you really try hard. So I suspect that the drug was applied to a larger area. One of the reasons why I suspect that is the case is because part of the results of the study was a global assessment of hair growth improvement by the investigators as well as patient self-assessment questionnaires. That implies that the drug was being applied to the whole balding area, not just a tiny area. This 1.9 square centimeter area was selected in the quote, anterior leading edge of the vertex thinning area, unquote. It turns out that the area they chose to test the drug had a pretty high baseline hair count between 305 to 327 hairs per square centimeter in the different study groups. Usually in antritic alopecia, hair counts are less than 100 hairs per square centimeter, so I guess you could say that the areas of balding chosen for testing in the study were pretty mild. The hair count measurement and hair width measurements were made with a camera that could magnify the target area up to 200 times. The study doesn't mention how the measurements were done, but most likely computer software was used. The hair counts were done at baseline and after 12 weeks and then after 24 weeks of treatment, so not really a long study. Like I mentioned, there were also global assessments of hair regrowth by the investigators and a patient questionnaire. Blood DHT and testosterone levels were also monitored during the study. Also, deuterostride levels were collected in 16 subjects. Okay, so let's get to the results. First of all, of the 135 men in the study, 127 finished the whole study, which isn't bad, not much dropout. Looking at total hair counts after 24 weeks of treatment, all treatment groups showed improvements, but dutasteride at 0.05% showed the most increase in hair counts. So if we go ahead and compare the different groups to each other, both topical dutasteride at 0.05% concentration and oral finasteride showed the biggest differences from placebo. But comparing dutasteride at 0.05% with finasteride at 1 mg per day, dutasteride showed a significantly better increase in hair counts. There was also improvement in hair width in all the treatment groups, though the differences between the treatment groups isn't very striking, and only dutasteride at 0.05% and finasteride at 1 mg per day were statistically different from the placebo group. The investigator's assessment judged the results from 0.05% topical dutasteride the best. Like many of these articles, they show some sample results, but I never know what to make of these types of pictures. I mean, are these really typical results, or are they skewed to make topical dutasteride look better? I mean, who knows? It looks like we have different lighting here, as well as different angles, so these photos aren't very useful in my opinion. Also, the subject self-evaluation showed that topical dutasteride at 0.05% seemed to be the best treatment, at least subjectively. There were no significant side effects in any group in the study, so that's good news. So like I said, the investigators measured testosterone and DHT levels. Topical dutasteride didn't have much effect on testosterone or DHT. However, it's notable that oral finasteride did increase testosterone by 20% at the end of the study, but it only decreased serum DHT levels by just 27% after 12 weeks, and then only by 11% after 24 weeks. That's much less DHT suppression than most other studies report with oral finasteride, and it really makes you wonder if the subjects were consistently taking the drug or if the preparation was unusual in some way. I really suspect that they weren't taking the drug consistently, though, because I have never seen any measurements of DHT suppression that, th that is that low in any other study that has been done on oral finasteride. Unfortunately, such a weak DHT suppression really brings into question one of the study results. Specifically, the claim that 0.05% topical dutasteride was superior to 1 mg of oral finasteride. Finally, in the 16 subjects on 0.05% topical dutasteride who had drug concentrations done, there were detectable levels of dutasteride in the blood in most of them, though the levels were very low. That indicates that there was some systemic absorption of dutasteride, but not a lot of it. So, overall, this study does show that topical dutasteride can be absorbed into the skin and can stimulate hair growth. Unfortunately, though, I don't think the data is strong enough to say it is really better than oral finasteride, but it is possible since oral dutasteride is better than oral finasteride. But, 
I've been purposely omitting one very important detail of the study until now. What is the preparation of topical dutasteride that the investigators were actually using? Well, it's definitely not homemade topical dutasteride. It was a, quote, novel topical dutasteride formulation, unquote. They actually give the ingredients in the article. So, as you can see, besides tutasteride, the formula contains alcohol, medium-chain triglycerides, and castor oil. So, this formula is patented by the drug company. Here's the patent right here. In the patent, there is a somewhat vague description of how the preparation is made. The drug company is called Shilpa Medicare, but I don't find topical tutasteride anywhere on their website for some strange reason. So, I don't know if you can just simply mix the ingredients together and duplicate their formula, although I probably wouldn't try it. Also, although the study design seems solid, the study was funded by the Shilpa Drug Company, and some of the investigators are actually employees of the company, so there is definitely a clear conflict of interest here. So this study shows that there are some preparations of topical tutasteride that can penetrate the skin, otherwise there wouldn't be systemic absorption. And it's certainly much better than the Zion data that was based on just 10 subjects. It looks like this company is going to do phase 3 studies before they market this product, but it does give me some hope that a well-tested topical tutasteride product will eventually come on the market, even if it's not available now to our knowledge. So. I still don't think that topical dutasteride is a trustworthy product for the moment. Using it as your primary 5-air inhibitor is extremely risky. It's possible future data could better validate topical dutasteride as a viable treatment, but using it now as your primary 5-air inhibitor is not advisable. Alright chums, that's it for now, so I'll see you all next time when we find out the secrets of hair regrowth from the God Emperor of Arrakis himself, Brian Johnson. Thank you for watching Hair Loss Witchers. God bless.